All right. Are you ready for the word, church? All right. Let's go to Hebrews uh, chapter 11. We're in our series looking at the heroes of the faith, and we are looking at Abraham on this weekend, the father of faith. I was in prayer, really praying about the message. I usually start my series preparation with prayer and just spending time with the Father and hearing his voice. And then I go to the text and then I begin to build the message. I felt like the Lord was saying to me very strongly, challenge the dads of the house. Challenge every man who's a father, whether you're a biological father or where you're a spiritual father, challenge our men to be men of God. Men have been really assaulted, put down, demeaned, and in, in every way in our society and culture today, the whole concept of biblical male leadership is being crushed underfoot of the enemy. I'm not saying any one particular place or person. I'm saying it is, it is demonic. And God wants to raise up a bunch of warriors. Some of you joined me in Monroe a month or so ago. I did a warrior conference for our men. And um, I love to... I love to challenge men. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you, dads. I'm going to challenge you, okay? What that means is, is with love, I may get in your grill a little bit, okay? But I want you to go out built up in courage knowing who you are in Christ, but I also want to light something. I want to light a fire under you because this is not the day and time for our men to be apathetic. All right. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8. By, by faith, everybody say faith. faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. See, good news out there. You might not know where you're going, no problem. God will get you there. Okay. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 10. Listen to this. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. Here's what I want to hit over the next few moments. I want to talk about obeying God. Obeying. Just obeying. <laughs> I grew up, my, my, my father died when I was 14. You've heard, heard me talk about my father, and you've also heard me talk about my mother. My father was a pushover compared to my mother. <laughs> my mother and her sister were raised in depression, in poverty. And they were two tough cookies. The rest of us in the family called them Heckle and Jekyll because they were so alike. But when mom <laughs> said something, you, 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 never, you, never, you never said, you know, in a minute, I'll do that, mom. <laughs> or you never talk back. Or you, even if you rolled your eyes, your head was going to roll. Anybody ever have a mom like that, okay? So obedience to me, and I'm, I'm not saying I was always obedient. I wasn't. I did a lot of crazy things, but I understood it, right? I understood that there were consequences for disobedience. And I never really blamed anybody else if mom punished me. I just didn't. I had it coming. I knew what obedience is. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that the church today as a whole doesn't fully understand obedience. And I, and I want to bring forth that subject of being obedient to God because blessings 
are right around the corner of obedience. All right? Um, one of the greatest gifts a father can leave his children or give his children, it is faith. It is a gift of faith. You know, if you can't give your kids anything else, give them faith. Because faith is a foundation they can spend the rest of their life living on. And everything goes crazy around them if they have faith. So it's a great gift. But listen, faith, biblical faith, is forged in the furnace of obedience. You want your faith to grow, it's forged in the, in the fires when, when, when everything around you is going a different way and saying a different thing and you are obedient, your faith is being forged. Now you can believe God. When you can do the right thing, when everything around you is on fire and blowing up, your faith will grow. The Bible says this, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but let's break this down and let's look at three crucial times it's important to believe and obey God. Number one, when it's time to leave. When it's time to leave, obey God and leave it to God. Genesis 12, 1 says this, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. Now, what did it mean to leave? What was Abraham leaving? He was leaving his father's house. And that's important to understand. In Abraham's day, the father's house was a, pat it was a patriarchal covering uh, for generations to come. They lived under that and it was passed on from, from father to son to son. It was a generational covering. It was a support system. It was a tribal protection. It was a system of economic prosperity. So when God called Abraham to leave, he was calling Abraham to leave his security, his, his economy, his family, all of the things that, that the, the generation of that day lived for. So he was asking him to leave quite a bit. See, the call to leave is important to obey because with disobedience, we stay put where we are at. We don't grow, we don't mature, we don't develop as leaders, we don't develop as people. When we refuse to obey, when God says to leave, and by the way, I'm not talking just about leaving uh, Illinois or leaving uh, a particular region or particular area. Sometimes God asks us to leave insecurity. He asks us to leave our pride. He asks us to leave a toxic relationship uh, that, 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 that's not good for us. He, he asks us to leave an addiction or a habit that is not going to take us to where God, what God has for us. He wants to pull these things out of us. And so he wants to not only pull it out of us, he wants to pull us out of it. And so sometimes he, he wants us to leave. He wanted Abraham to get out of, of, the, uh, of the land of the Chaldeans. He wanted to take him to a new place where it's, it's city, it's founda it's, the foundation of the city was the architect of God. Pull him out of his pagan religion and bring him into uh, a relationship with Jehovah God. See, God is always asking us men to leave something that we bound to. It might be part of our family. It might be a part of our history. It might be a part of something way before us. It might be generationally long. And he's saying, leave that. Get away from that because I'm taking you to new places. I'm making you a new man. I'm making your family a new family. I don't want you to stay in the same old place, going through the same old things, having the same old addictions and problems and difficulties. I want to create in you something new, something vibrant, and I want you to leave the old and come into the new. Now, when you do that, Listen, here's what happens. Three things happen. You demonstrate your acknowledgement of God's will. You're saying, God, your will for my life, not mine. God's way, God, your way is better than my way, and I'm not going to be stuck in my way. 
when you have a better way and God's work. And what is God's work? God's work is the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is to direct our paths. When God calls us to leave, he's setting up for our next. When God says leave something, that means he has something. If he wants you to remove yourself from something, he's going to take you into something. Number two. Here's the second thing I believe God wants us to be obedient in, is when you don't know where to go or how to get there, that you still obey. Not knowing where to go or not knowing what to do is not an excuse for disobedience. So God said to Abraham, I want you to leave. Where are we going? I don't know. (laughs) I'll just show you. Okay, I'll show you where to go. So Abraham had to step out in faith and trust God. Because there's times in our lives we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. So what do we do? We keep obeying. Oftentimes it's in those times we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. Is when there's a vulnerability to just not obey God, but just obey our own emotions, our own feelings, our own understandings. Now, if you're in a situation where you don't know what to go, you don't know what to do, there's three things I want to give to you to do that will be very helpful. Number one, keep your tank filled. What tank? Your grace tank. So you keep, your, keep it filled. Look, if you don't know what to do and you don't know where to go, keep, keep your spiritual life filled. Keep coming to church. You know, the enemy, the enemy really did a job on people during COVID and trying to shut, shut the church down and shut community down and shut our fellowship down. Mm, that ticks me off to this day. And we did a lot of cool creative things. We had drive-in church and all and internet church and this and that and that. But you know what? Jesus, he, Jesus didn't say, I will build my drive-in church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But really what he was trying to do is he was trying to Back, break us away from being connected together so that our grace tank would be filled. You know, when you don't know what to do, you need your tank filled. You need your spiritual man filled up. You You need to come to a worship service and worship God with all your heart and hear his voice and hear his presence. And I I I don't understand why so many people haven't returned to church after COVID. What in the world are people thinking? Now I know. Just smile because you're here. I'm preaching. Yeah, I'm preaching to the choir right now because you're all here. You're going, Pastor. Why are you so pumped? Up? It's because their lives, their tank is going to be low. And what happens when a decision needs to be made and something needs to happen? We're we're moving into the most crucial time in the history of America, in my humble opinion. Where decisions are being made that could change our country, could change the scope of mankind forever and ever, and Christians haven't come back to church yet? Come on, church, help me. Am I the only one that's a little bit ticked off about that? Man, we need to be in force right now. We need to be an army right now. We need to be empowered right now. Not out there just wondering what in the world's going to happen. And I don't want to say anything because I don't want anybody to criticize me. While the whole world. (sighs) Your tank needs to be filled. How far are you going to make it on a journey? On one tank of gas, you have to stop, you have to refill. You need spiritual in your tank because you don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what situation you might face tomorrow. We think we do. We're grumpy about Monday already. (laughs) We think it's going to be the same old, same old, but we never know when we're going to wake up to something different. When we're going to need to be on top spiritually so the enemy cannot destroy, discourage, de- de- delay us, detain us, or detour us. Yeah. Yeah. Keep that tank filled. 
Here's how David did it. I love this. David, here's how David kept his tank filled, Psalm 77, 11. I will recall, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. David, when he got discouraged, he started saying, you know what? I remember a time when a bear came against me and the annoying came on me and I took care of the bear. There was a time when a lion came against me and I took care of the lion and then pff, Goliath and then this battle and that battle, but the Lord was faithful. And then he went all the way back to the Old Testament and he, or to the, to the time before him and he started quoting all the times that the waters parted and God spared his people. You might say, well, I don't have a big testimony. Well, just read the Bible. Got any rivers you think are imp impassable? God can part the water for you. You got walls you can't get past? He knocked down Jericho. There is nothing he can't do. He fed people. You think, oh, no, what are we going to do if, if, if food shortage hits? What are we going to do? God can send down food from heaven. Who do we worship? Do we worship the economy? Do we worship the systems? Do we worship agriculture? Or do we worship the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the provider of heaven and earth? There is nothing that he cannot do for you. David said, I will recall the greatness of God when I start to get discouraged, when I start to get depressed. <laughs> oh, come on, dads. Give me an amen out there. Listen, when you don't know, oh, I'm just getting warmed up. When you don't know where to go, know where you won't go. No, be predetermined in, in, in working with men of, of all ages, one of the things that I preach over and over is predetermine your decision so that you don't get caught in a trap. Because the enemy wants to trap you. But already predetermine. You might not know where you're going, but you can know where you won't go. What are you talking about, Pastor Rich? Okay, let me break it down for you. I'm glad you asked. Genesis 39, 9 says, no one is greater in this house. This is Joseph. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you. This is when Potiphar's wife came by, tried to dangle her little earrings in front of him to knock him off his course, to knock him off of the vision that God gave him to be the ruler. Because you are... Mm, my master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You know what Joseph did? He predetermined where he wasn't going to go. You know, and he, didn't, he wasn't where he wanted to be. His family rejected him. He was sold into slavery. He ended up in Potiphar's house as a slave. He wasn't where he wanted to be, but he knew where he wasn't going. He wasn't going with Potiphar's wife. Make sure you know where you're not going to go. Be a determined dad that you know where you won't go. That you're not going to give that example to your kids. That you're not going to pass that on from generation to generation. Drug addiction will not be part of our family. Pornography will not be a part of our family. Adultery and infidelity will not be a part of our family. And if it's happened, just come clean with God and stop the record straight. God is a merciful, forgiving, loving God who will forgive your sins and get you moving back in the right direction. But now be determined you will never go there again. That's a boundary I don't pass. Come on, somebody help me out there. I told you I was going to bring it, didn't I? Yeah. Watch this. When you don't know where to go, don't react in fear. Genesis 22. <laughs> and there, this, this is a great story. And there Abraham said of his wife Sarah, she is my sister. It was a half truth, by the way. Then Abimelech, king of Gur, sent for Sarah and took her. Now, this... This is a crazy story. Sarah's in her 70s-ish, and the kings are like, who that? Who that? That's a good looking. 
And old Abe, man of faith, is scared and says, oh, because he thought they were going to kill him and take her. He said, that's my sister. Well, they took her anyways, right? Because now she's free. Now, here's this kind of this part where we're all human, right? So Abraham's his father of faith. Faith was credited him. His faith was credited him as righteousness. But he had this weakness. He had a moment of fear. So when you, sometimes when you're on a path and you don't know where you're going, make sure you don't act out, react out of fear because fear causes you to do... It, it, theologically, here's the word. It, it, and I looked it up in the Greek and the Hebrew. And theologically, fear causes you to do something stupid. I looked it up in the lexicon. It said stupid or very, very dumb. So don't, don't react out of fear. Take a step back. Decide what you're going to do. Well, listen, King. This is my wife. And if you try and messing with her, God will take you out. You know what? They already knew that. Once they found out it was his wife, they were like, get her out of here. You've brought a curse on us. They had more fear of God than Abraham did. Come on, Abe, wake up. You're getting a little old, but that's not an excuse. Don't act out of fear when you don't know where to go and you don't know what to do. Well, what should I do, Pastor? You should obey God. Obey God. Obey God. One day at a time, one step at a time. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll direct you. He'll show you what your next is, but keep obeying God. Okay, one last thing. When do we obey God? We obey God... Even when human reasoning doesn't add up. This is an amazing story. I'm just going to share it with you quickly. But this is an amazing thing that happens. So remember the whole story with Isaac. God promised them a son. They were past childbearing years. And they had Isaac. But before that, Sarah and Abraham... They tried to fulfill God's promises in their own way. And Hagar went in and laid with Abraham and Ishmael. Okay, that was... Now Isaac, years later, Isaac, God, the Bible says God tests Abraham. Okay, so in your journey of life, in your walk of faith, God doesn't tempt, but he does test and so he tests Abraham in the very thing that Abraham kind of flunked the test the first time. He wanted to see something. So he, call, he had Isaac, he had Abraham take Isaac up to offer him as a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Now think about this for a moment. Have you ever tried to reason with God? Thank you. Two of you? Two, three. Rest of you, hello? You ever tried to reason with God? It's like, God, can you think of this? Why, why would God take this poor couple, finally fulfill this promise, and then say, give him back? Did you ever wonder about that? What's up with that? It doesn't make sense. I mean, you can even get really spiritual about things. You can you get spiritual. I go, wait, 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 God. You gave us this son. Certainly you don't want us. That wouldn't be right. That's murder. Right? God said, no. I want Isaac. Guess what Abraham did this time? He passed the test. He passed the test. So here's, here's what he did. And I want to show you these because these are really important. Number one, he acted quickly. Everybody say quickly. quickly. Genesis 22, 3 said, early the next morning. Psalms 119, 60 says, I will be quick to obey your commands. I will not be slow to do that. It's like immediate obedience will keep you from human reasoning. You ever been 
sitting in a worship service, or you ever been praying and God just comes and speaks something to you? Like, go take cookies to your neighbor or something, and you're like, I don't like my neighbor. And God says, I don't care. Take them cookies. Or something, something where God's leading you and you're trying to work through this human reasoning part of it. The quicker we act, the more we don't lean to our own under reason. See, faith works by saying, I know that's God, and I do it. I'm not, I'm not worried. You are not responsible for results. You are responsible for the action of acting out of obedience. The results are God's responsibility. By the way, that makes life a lot easier if you're not having to stress and worry about results. All you have to know is, did I do the right thing? Okay? So, the second thing he did is he acted exactly. The, biblical obedience is based upon exact. Exact. The, the very steps. Go the next morning. Go to Mount Moriah. Offer Isaac. It wasn't pick up another pagan child along the way and sacrifice them. <laughs> it was take your take your one, take your son, your beloved son, and offer him on the sacrifice. Exactly. He didn't delay. He didn't detour. He went exactly to the location he was told to go. To Moriah. Now, here's a special point of interest on this. I want to show you something. So they're they're going up. Isaac, Isaac knew what they were doing. Because Isaac stopped and goes, "Hey, Dad, there's the wood, there's the fire, but where's the where's the sacrifice?" <laughs> well, son. <laughs> by the way, now, here's what here's what Abraham said. He said, "Isaac, the Lord will provide." It's the first mention of one of God's names, Jehovah Jireh. God's provision will be seen. <sighs> Come on, church, you didn't get that. The very act of obedience. See, see he is mentoring Isaac. He's mentoring him. They've been, they've been to the place of sacrifice before. Oh, come on, dads, help me out. Those kids have been to church. They've been to Kids Link. They've been to Crave. They've been to the altar. They've been in the Word. They've, been, they've met the Holy Spirit. He had mentored them. Hey, dads, it's our responsibility to mentor our kids. It's not the school system's responsibility. It's not the government's responsibility. It's our responsibility to mentor our kids. Isaac knew the routine. He knew something was missing. He just didn't know it was him. <laughs> okay? So he acted exactly. And then the third thing is he acted in faith. Genesis 22 one says this. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. Once again, this was a test. Previously, Abraham had succumbed to human reasoning about in having a son, and he tried to manipulate the system. He tried to fulfill the promise in his own strength. This time, God was going to see if Abraham could truly act in faith, and he did. Now watch this, Romans 4, 3 says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Wow, wow. Now. Worship team, come on out. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. And I want to show you something that I believe is going to change your life. And it's found in, in James chapter 2. Abraham's obedience. Now watch this. Abraham's obedience turned his blessing into a magnanimous blessing. What do I mean? When he went up to Moriah, he had Isaac. When he came down with Isaac, because the Lord provided the ram in the thicket, which is representative of Jesus, 
who instead of you and I going unto the altar of sacrifice and dying for our sins, Jesus took our sins on the cross. He took our sinfulness and he gave us his righteousness. Righteousness comes and it's accredited to us when we act in believing in faith in Jesus. You're not saved because you're good. You're saved because he's good. You didn't do anything to deserve it, but he gave it to you. And you receive it by faith. But faith has to act. You don't just say, I have faith. I have faith. I'm a man of faith. Where is your action? Abraham just didn't say, I'm a man of faith. He took his son, and he obeyed God, and he went to the mountain, and he got that close. And he was in full obedience that God would provide, and Jehovah Jireh provided. Jesus is our provider. But we have to act in faith on what he did for us. Here's the way James puts it. I love this. You guys can get... You can, Give me some background, please. Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Listen to this. You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete. How do I complete my faith? It was made complete by what he did. What he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. This is a guy who gave his wife away. Now he's a man of faith? Abraham believed God and was credited him as righteous, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and spent them all off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Here's my faith. My faith is, okay, God said go to the mountain. Go to the mountain. God said leave. I leave. God says there's an anointing to drum. I drum. He says, I'm a worship leader. Okay, a worship leader. Wait, I don't feel like being a worship. Doesn't matter. I mean, your feelings matter. But feelings can't get in the way of obedience. If God said it, you got to do it. You got to line up with it. That's what turns things around. What does that do? See, there's a powerful blessing in this. Because once we get in a flow of this... He brings us into the next. Abraham was stuck in the Ur of the Chaldeans. Now he becomes the father of a great, not just the father of Isaac, but the father of a great nation. For generation after generation, his blessing turned into a magnet, magnanimous blessing because he obeyed God. God wants to bless you, but he's waiting for you to act upon what he's told you to do and how to get there. He says, There's, for some of you, this weekend, God wants you to leave. Some of you men, God wants you to leave. I want everybody to stand right now all across our campuses. Come on. Second half of church. See, God's, God's calling some of you to leave something. You got to leave it. If you don't leave it, it's going to haunt you, and it's going to haunt your kids and your kids' kids. But you have the power to stop that thing right now. Some of you, he's asking you to do something, but your human reasoning's not ticking with it. God wants you to act on that. See, God's wanting to do this in your lives, all right? So here's what we're going to do all across our campuses and those that are watching me online right now, if you can. I want, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm getting serious about this. I want every man in the house 
every man in the house that would say with me, Pastor Rich, no more. I am not going to be just led astray by any and everything. I'm going to be led by God. And to my best ability, if I hear his voice, I will obey his voice. I want every man that, that that's you right now. I want you to come right down and stand in this altar. I want to pray for every man that's got that call in their life right now. You want to be an obedient man of God. You want to be like Abraham who was willing to act and respond on faith, not human reasoning. You might not understand what you've been through, but you're ready for a breakthrough in your life. You're ready for the challenge to be a man of God. And I'm going to pray all across our campuses, those that are watching online, men are online watching, are listening to this. We're going to raise up an army of men of God. Amen. And I want all of you, wives and ladies and everybody else that's out there, I want you to reach out right now to all of us. And let's ask for God's blessing upon our leadership and our willingness to obey. And I'm feeling in my spirit there's some things that when I talked about obedience, when I talked about leaving something, many of you had something in your heart you knew right away God was saying, leave it behind, make it, make it part of your history and not part of your future. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we call on the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We ask you to fill this place right now with the anointing to lead, the anointing to be strong, the anointing to be obedient, the anointing to be a man of God in these days where so many structures are being torn down when it comes to authority, anointing, and purity, and honesty, and integrity, and character, and leadership. God, I pray for an anointing to be a man of God. I pray that these are the, I pray that the days ahead of us as men would be the best days of our lives, that we would be uh, greater empowered, we would be greater in our faith, greater in our determination to be the men of God that you've called us to be. So I pray in the name of Jesus, Lord, bring down your anointing and bring it down in a powerful way all across our campuses, all across this region. Raise up an army, God. Raise up an army of men that will not bow to the God of this world but we will stand boldly in your presence. And I thank you for these men, and I bless them, and I pray the blessings of God would be on them as they lead, guide, and direct. In Jesus' name, and all God's people prayed. Did you pray amen? Amen. Can you give God praise? Amen. Thanks for watching Crossroads Community Church online. We'd love to hear that you are here today. You can fill out our online connection card with your prayers, praises, and any questions you have at crossroadscn.com connection. Links are also provided in our bio. If you want to stay up to date, check out our website for upcoming events that are happening at your campus. Thanks again for watching. God bless.